Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. From you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, God in the highest, and, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from 2 Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking out on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David um, sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Ur Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself again after her period. There she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. The, Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go to, down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with his servant with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by, by his hand, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God.
psalm appointed for today is Psalm 14. We will uh, say it by half verse. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and committed a comical acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all. To see if there is anyone who is wise. If there is one who seeks after God. Everyone has proved faithless. All alike have turned bad. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers? We read up my people like bread, and do not call upon the Lord. See how they tremble with fear. Because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted. But the Lord is your aim. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice in Israel and be glad. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. And Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. For what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, 
and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. So I want to talk today about uh, how to say comfort in the midst of distress. Uh, we see that with the disciples in a way they're distressed, they're, they're <laughs> in, in kind of difficult circumstances going across the lake and then Jesus appears, in other words, that he's with them and he comes to them in a time of great difficulty. So I'm going to read a kind of reflection of one sort of time of great difficulty to kind of set a context for this. I came across this the past week. It was uh, apparently written by someone in Oregon, uh, where you may be well aware there's a huge uh, fire burning, about covered, has covered about 400,000 uh, acres. The bootleg fire, uh, so significant, has impacted the air quality on the East Coast. But anyway, so this person writes, it's like Oregon, like directed to the state of Oregon. The wild critters are going to be moving towards town. Their area is burning. Their flight instincts will kick in. That means deer, elk, coyote, bear, and anything else running around the mountains. Bring in your pets and put out some buckets of water for them. They will be scared and tired. Do not shoot them. Their world is burning and they have nowhere to go. Their world is burning, and they have nowhere to go. Do you ever feel that way? Have you ever felt that way, that your world is burning, and you have nowhere to go? That anywhere you turn may be just like those animals coming down from the mountains, like, boom, what are you, I don't want you in in my yard, I mean, I don't want you in my space. Get the heck out of here. I was, I was literally reading a news account. This is, I guess this is my sermon from the news, but a news account of someone who was driving and had a seizure and ran off the road and into like a neighbor. I mean, somebody from their neighborhood's yard. Then someone ran into the front yard to help them and the person came out, let him die somewhere else. Get out of my yard. I mean, no, no. That's, that's not, not how we, we do these things. I mean, the world is burning and there's nowhere to go. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, maybe, you know, people have lost jobs. People have lost places to live. People have lost the connectedness with others, been cooped up in rooms, and all of this. And it can feel isolated. It can feel desperate. It can feel deeply concerned and alone, but just to remember that the way we respond in these times makes all the difference in the world. So just like, again, the disciples are out on the water, it's night, the, it's, the way is hard, they're troubled, and then Jesus, and, and he's coming to them, and their first response is, again, a fear. He said, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. How many times does Jesus have to say that? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid if they call you before the, the governing authorities of the day and put you on trial. Don't be afraid. If you don't know what the next step is going to be, don't be afraid. But it's not just a shallow assurance. It's a genuine offer of help. But it's also a reminder to us that we're involved in it, as we were talking about in the adult class this morning, that in one sense of the word, we are the body of Christ in the world. We're the feet, the hands, the eyes, the, the heart, if you will, his heart working through us, but we're there for a reason. We're here for a reason. It's a, as we said, an incarnate faith. I mean, in the flesh. And for it to be in the flesh, that means yours and mine. So we show up, we speak up, we offer what we've got. Now, what we've got it may not be the magic solution to everybody's problem. Um, I mean, I, I don't have enough food in, in my pantry, and Victoria and I are a little pantry to feed the multitude, for example, but we can still show up. We can still show up, and we can understand that we're not the only desperate people, and it's okay to feel desperate. 
It's not like we have to be, you know, cheery and, oh, well, everything's under control and everything. No, everything's not under control. You know, the disease gets worse, the numbers go up. You know, you may feel like the world's on fire, but we're not alone. And we're given guidance. We're given hope. We're given a promise. We're given a community. We're given each other. But for it to work, we have to show up. We have to show up willing to help as we can, willing to offer ourselves as we're able, available, open to, to help and to make a difference in the place where we are. And to know that nothing is to be wasted. And sometimes I feel like people, it's, it's like you want the best, and so anything that goes awry or amiss, that's just a waste. It's not. As I look at my own story, sometimes the times that seemed most dislocated, most, gosh, what's going to happen next? As I look back on those, those were the times of growth. Those were the times when a quantum leap ahead was possible. Those were the times when it was possible to discover and rediscover what really matters and what can be done. So it's like we were talking about today. Uh, sometimes we learn to adapt. And if this isn't the ideal, but we find a plan B that's still pretty good, or something that can still make a difference. But the point is, we don't do it alone. When we come to this place, it's not just like me individual or you individual, we've got to work it out with God above. We're drawn to a community. We're drawn to a place where two or three or more are gathered together in our Lord's name. And that He's in the midst of us as we do what we do. So the love we share is a reflection of God's love. The help we offer is a reflection of the help that's offered by God. But it still needs to be made incarnate, put in the flesh by real people who say real things and do real things, like show up, like whatever, <laughs> build a sidewalk or prepare a meal or, <laughs> you know, get people together, hand out water when people are thirsty. And all those little things, they make a difference, I promise you. I, I spend a lot of time talking with people about their stories. They just simple acts of kindness that people can remember. They remember the person that helped them find their way when they were lost or gave them uh, you know, a, a quarter when they needed to, to buy a cold drink or something. Just some little thing that was almost just a throwaway. Maybe the person who did it didn't remember it the next day, but they remembered. They remembered that someone cared enough to go out of their way for five minutes of their life to offer a little bit of help. Someone took the time to listen. Someone opened the door when their hands were full or when they were trying to move from one place to another and came out to help. I mean, it wasn't high tech, but someone took the time to, to lift a heavy box or something to help them get from point A to point B. You don't need three graduate degrees to do this, friends. You just need to share what's in your heart if you find our Lord with you. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, description of uh, uh, the aftermath, if you will, of the feeding of the multitude you know, which is this amazing kind of miracle. But they gather up the fragments. They gather up the fragments so that nothing may be lost. Uh, a pretty famous Episcopal priest from the 19th century, James DeCoven, once preached a sermon about gathering the fragments. And he was a person who had been through sort of the controversies of his day and the, the church politics of that era. And it kind of got me gotten a pretty good beating at times, but but at the end of his his life and ministry, he'd say, like, gather up the fragments of a life. And in a sense, that's something that we all do at all the times. I mean, all these little things that started and stopped, or this went so far, and this was another piece and that. But the idea is that all of it comes together in Christ. That which is complete and that which is incomplete, that which is begun and not yet completed, we gather up the fragments and we help one another to gather up the fragments to make a whole that is greater than us, to make a whole that reflects the miracle that the fragments came from so they're brought back together again in a completion beyond what any of us can imagine. So I'm just saying, don't imagine that the fragment is wasted. 
Don't imagine that because something you know had this little piece that it can't be part of a larger whole. I mean, you know, like think of a mosaic. Same thing, like you put together all of these little pieces and they form a more beautiful whole than you could have ever imagined. Treating them as individuals. And that's precisely the point that our Lord loves us individually, loves us one on one, but yet calls us together into a whole, a life, a community, a church, a body in the world that's bigger than any of us and that expresses a love that's beyond any of us and yet it transforms each of us with a love that saves even when it seems like the world is burning. Stand as you're able. We'll sing together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, and Mark Van Covering, our bishop. For Father Slocum, our priest in partnership, and for all bishops and other ministers. We ask your prayers for those on our diocesan intercessory prayer list. St. John's Church for Sales, the Reverend Dana Lockhart, priest in charge, and the Reverend Deacon Emily Cardwell. We also pray for the bishop, clergy, and laity of the Scottish Episcopal Church. For all in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, including Julia, Jim, Norm, Mabel, Susanna, Cynthia, Walker, Sherry, Beverly, Betty, Becky, Tom, and the Nichols family. We also remember those in the armed services, both home and abroad, and all who have suffered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, including Holly, Abby, Gabe, Shauna, Jeff, and Tommy. Lord, for your, for your, for, for your 
for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, for the birthdays of Marge Neff and Bill Ratley. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, including Claude Haynes and Kim Powers, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have, Have mercy upon us, most, most merciful Father. Father. In, in your, your compassion, compassion forgive us our sins, sins known and unknown, things, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name will be saved. Holy, holy, holy. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, 
And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Please stand as you're able or need. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.